tractor, planting pesticide-coated seeds on a field in Minnesota. And only a hundred yards downwind, thousands of bees begin to die. This one looks like a fairly young bee over here that's trying to move, but it's just in the last throws also. What was once considered a mysterious phenomenon is now much better understood. Bee colonies collapse when they are exposed to acute and sublethal levels of pesticides, which allow pests and diseases to increase. With the loss of diverse pollinator habitat and pesticides tainting the habitat, beekeepers continue to see their bees dying too early and they are unable to repopulate the hives in order to sustain them. Reasons for the decline of the bees may be many, but most beekeepers agree heavy pesticide use is a key part of the problem. There are at least four pathways by which bees can be exposed to lethal pesticides. One of the most common exposures occurs when seeds are being coated at the farm location and the pesticides that are coated onto the seeds are scraped off during the planting process, creating a large pesticide-laden dust cloud, which drifts onto blooming plants and exposes bees to toxic pesticides. The situation was made worse when a new class of highly toxic systemic insecticides were introduced, neonicotinoids, or neonics. Neonics are now the most widely used insecticides in the world. And as their use becomes more widespread, more bees are declining. In response to a wealth of science indicating that the systemic neonics are harmful to bees, governments and countries across the world have taken action to restrict the use of neonics including Canada and the European Union. Here in the United States, the federal government has failed to take similar protective measures. However, several states and numerous cities across the country have already enacted legislation and resolutions to restrict the use of neonics. And we're just getting started. More people are protesting the use of harmful pesticides contributing to bee decline. For the past decade, scientists have been trying to figure out why so many of the country's honeybees have been dying. Earlier this week, I spoke with Minnesota-based commercial beekeeper James Cook. Cook just completed a cross-country tour to bring attention to the issue. He drove a truck with a display of two and a half million dead bees to help demonstrate the scale of the problem. James Cook is a young beekeeper who had no plans to be on national television. And that is something that I really learned along the way, that honestly farmers need to be and will have to be an integral part of the solution. I don't want beekeepers and farmers getting pitted up against each other. But after James lost 40% of his hives one summer day at the farm where he worked in Minnesota, he took action. He loaded 2.5 million dead bees onto his truck and set off to drive to Washington, D.C. And on his way, he talked to scientists, beekeepers, farmers, and consumer advocates worried about the alarming decline in bee populations. My hope in doing this is that maybe uh, showing a young face, somebody who's looking at doing this for the rest of their life, might bring a few more voices out and speak up about issues that we're all seeing. And the struggle that James and thousands of other beekeepers face is very real. The numbers came in from the Bee Inform Partnership, uh, which does a survey of American beekeepers to try to get a tally of how much bee loss there was um, in this past year. It's been reported that there was 40% loss. That's a dramatic amount of bees gone. 
impact of neonicotinoids noises is my suspicion. Uh, we had, um, in fact, we saw that two years in a row. While we didn't lose 100% two years in a row, we did see, I did see uh, those kind of telltale signs. Now that is just counting the honeybees that are kept by humans. That's not counting how many uh, feral colonies there are. And it's also not counting the native pollinators for which there are thousands of species. The uh, hives, the colonies look great. You know, they look like they were nice and strong and then come uh, October, November, so. And it's not just honeybees are in trouble. I mean, it's all the beneficial insects are in trouble. And if we change the soil, our soil management and go back to where we need to be, the pollinator issue will straighten itself out. The first stop on James' trip, South Dakota, for a visit with Dr. Jonathan Lundgren. Lundgren helped to discover a link between pesticide use and bee decline. I mean, human race depends on pollination. Uh, I mean, you lose pollinators, you lose plants, you lose people. That's just that simple. Dr. Lundgren was discouraged from working at his job at the USDA by officials suppressing his research. Many feel that the chemical industry has influenced U.S. policies that allow large amounts of the pesticides that are harming bees to easily enter the market. So something like neonicotinoids, which are very toxic to bees, if it's used in a potted plant, that's one one risk scenario. But the problem with these chemistries is that right now they are truly being used on, I estimate, approximately 13% of the terrestrial land surface of North America. I'm afraid we're going to wake up one day and say, hey, <clears throat> we sure made a mistake here. At least I hope somebody wakes up and says we made a mistake because this is definitely affecting, you know, not only our honeybees, it's affecting my kids and my grandkids, you know, and, and everybody else out there. Despite the challenges, there's hope for the bees. People are starting to advocate for bees on a local level and with great success. James learned of one example of successful local action when he visited Montevideo in his home state of Minnesota. He saw how one grassroots group, Humming for Bees, had success when they went to the town of Sherwood and asked Councilwoman Christine Sunberg to help them ban bee-killing chemicals in their community. I was well aware of the issues, you know, with the bee population demise and how that impacts our food chain, our economic uh, system, etc. It didn't dawn on me that we as a city could be a part of that solution until Patricia and all of the others came to us. And really what they did were two things. Sounds simple, but it wasn't, but educate us and then offer a solution. And it was a really easy solution. It wasn't tough. It didn't cost a lot of money uh, that we'd have people come pounding on our doors about, you know, that sort of thing. But it, it was a start. It get that momentum going. Ultimately, because of the grassroots work of a few people in local communities, the entire state of Minnesota passed legislation to limit the use of systemic bee-killing chemicals. Christy Allen is an urban beekeeper who runs programs to educate children and the public about bees. She maintains over a hundred hives throughout urban Minneapolis and sells honey using bicycles as transportation. On an individual level, it is all about consumer power. It's where you put your money, uh, what you're supporting, day-to-day -day decisions that are important. If you don't want to put it in your body, um, you probably don't want to put it on the landscape. James' final stop before entering Washington was Raleigh, North Carolina, 
where toxic-free North Carolina is fighting for a toxic-free society, including making the state safer for bees by enacting pollinator policy. That policy is beginning to make inroads in the local farming community. Uh, we're a grass-fed bee farm. We're part of the paradigm shift we've been hearing about. Let's do away with this distinction between the environment, people, and all other life on Earth. It's false and it endangers us. Bees and managed honeybees are considered livestock by USDA. Now you tell me any other livestock in this country that you can lose 40% of nationally and the USDA and Congress is not up in arms. If you had 40% of the cattle in this country die, you're right, there's be some changes going on. The rally in Raleigh also underscores the urgent need for action today. If we don't do it first, we don't have any power. We just got mouth game. A bright summer day in the heart of Washington, D.C. James and the Keep the Hives Alive tour have made it. It's a great day for all these people who come from all over the country to be here and to give bees a chance. In front of the EPA building and within earshot of the people who can change national environmental policy, the message is delivered loud and clear. Keep the hives alive! Keep the hives alive! Enough is enough. We have to keep the hives alive. Uh, we started in Brookings, South Dakota. And... After a nine-day, 3,400-mile journey through the heart of America's bee country, James capped his road trip by joining many others to deliver almost five million petitions, asking for stronger protections for bees. The next day, they met with EPA officials and congressional staffers, and the goals of the Keep the Hives Alive tour were met. James brought the hopes and fears of beekeepers and bee advocates from across the country to the policy makers in Washington, where more and more people are listening. Now more than ever, we must act to keep the hives alive. Well, I'm back working with our hives, pollinating crops and making honey but bees still need your help. Learn more and take action at our website and help us keep the hives alive. <laughs>